much for having me here and thank you for the opportunity I would I'll start with my speech all right so I have a dream and I wish to make technology that is inclusive I feel exclusion is a form of torture it's a form of torture that humans should not experience and there is a community that faces this on a daily basis they're the deaf community and I've been working with them creating inclusive technologies for them and in that process, I have seen how different designs in production can cause the lack of inclusion of their culture. So I'll take you through a story of how McDonald's, when they came to India for the first time, created their burgers or designed their burgers. Now, imagine this. I am coming from McDonald's America for the first time to India, and I love the Indian food culture. So I've decided to open a franchise selling burgers here. In this, I have two conditions while making these burgers. The first one being, I should be able to mass produce this, and it should be widely consumed. Now, the first thing we would do is obviously go to our potential customers and ask them, what would you like in this burger, and what are you expecting from us? Now, the answers you would probably get is like, I would like my burger to have paneer, or I would like my burger to have chicken. Maybe I would like my burger patty to be made out of potato. Now, these are too many options, and it's impossible to make every single type of burger for them, because we need to mass produce this, right? So what we will do is we will choose a standard burger and make a standard burger for it. Right now, I will dial it down to two options, one wedge, one non-wedge, and we'll do a poll. Based on the majority, we will make our burger. So all those who prefer a wedge burger, please raise your hands. OK. And all those who, you can keep it down. Now, all those who prefer non-wedge burger, please raise your hands. Now, as the majority wants a wedge burger, I'll design a wedge burger and sell a wedge burger. And those of you who feel like I have not included your choice, the non-wedge choice, you may feel culturally excluded. But you need to keep in mind that I am dealing with a designer's dilemma. Now, what is this designer's dilemma? So. The more types of burgers I include or sell, the less I can mass produce this. Then, of course, the efficiency and the profit that I make out of it is lower. So there is a balance that I need to strike between inclusion of a culture, so then the people would like it, and the standardization of burger for profit or widespread usage of it. Now, dealing with this balance is actually quite hard. So for now, we will be taking an extreme, and that would be looking at the efficiency. So then we can widely spread this quickly and mass produce this. This approach is called a user-centered approach. Now, in the user-centered approach, what we do is what we do is we imagine a user, an average Indian as the user. We imagine with all the most popular cultural food takes and then we design a burger for him. Now, the problem is that it will only include a bit of your culture. It's not too culture-specific, so nobody is going to like it that much. But we hope that our customers would change their cultural opinion after tasting our burger and slowly come to like it. This is a user-centered approach that McDonald's used when they first came to India. But it doesn't always work. Because sometimes the users are stubborn, they don't want to change their culture, or they are unable to change their cultural preference because of external factors. I've been dealing with this issue for about two and a half years, dealing with this dilemma of balancing it in the context of creating assistive technologies for the hearing impaired. Now, consider the example as smart glove. A smart glove. It is hailed as an inclusive device. It translates sign language into audio and text for the hearing enabled to understand. It bridges the gap between the deaf and the hearing enabled. But in this, we need to use a user-centered approach. 
because we want to spread it out to all the people and to the maximum amount of people. So like in the burger scenario where we had different preferences, different cultural preferences, over here the deaf have different cultural preferences over the sign language that they use. So they usually choose the sign language that is mostly rooted into their local culture. So while we are developing this, like in the burger scenario where we had to make a standard burger for mass production, over here we'll have to make, we'll have to use the standard sign language. And when we do so, it will cause cultural exclusion. But in this case, two cultural exclusions. So, firstly, for the users who aren't using the tech, they will feel a cultural exclusion, they are unable to use it. And the second type of cultural exclusion that we see over here is if they change from their local culture to the standard sign language. They would feel cultural or local, um, local, they will feel local exclusion. So both ways it's a loss and you cannot do much about it. Now, how did this design fare? Yeah, so how did this design fare in the market? Very few people used it. So the solution that they proposed was that what if we standardize sign language or uh, like what if we impose the standardized sign language, force the deaf people to change their sign language and study the standard sign language so that they could use the technologies. Well, they actually tried that and that of course caused further exclusion. And overall the product had fewer users for some reason. So this brings in the question, why is it that the deaf are unable to change their culture. Is it because they are stubborn or is it because there's an external factor? To understand this, we need to understand how they experience these technologies that use the standardized sign language. So over here in India, we have a standardized sign language. It's called ISL, Indian Sign Language. And we have a sign for married women. We cup our hands together and then we touch the nasal groove of our nose, indicating the married woman's wearing a nose ring. But this is very culture specific, as we know that many women in India who are married may not wear a nose ring, or women who aren't married may wear a nose ring. So this brings in confusion for the deaf while they're learning standardized sign language. Like they will look around them and see it's not matching. And now if they learn the standard sign language, it causes a disconnect between them and their local culture. So this is one problem that they face, but it actually worsens. Not only does the standard sign language have culture-specific signs, many of the signs require non-manual signs. What are these non-manual signs? It's like facial expressions or body movement, hand movement. And these movements are very, very crucial in this sign language as it connotes the emotion, the tone, the context, the signing, which makes the culture rich. And then when we try to standardize it, it doesn't work. Let me give you an example. We have uh, in Hindi a word called tanki. Its literal meaning is water tank. All right? And the sign is like this. Its connotative meaning is drunkard. So we usually wave our head or act drunk to indicate that we are implying the connotative meaning. Now when we try to standardize this, it's quite impossible because we cannot tell them like, oh please, please uh, tilt your head 45 degrees and then move your body like this way. It is unreasonable and it doesn't work. And if we do so, we simplify it to a like to an extent where we cannot show like how drunk the person is or to what degree do we mean this and then we lose this cultural heritage that they had. Now, this goes beyond this. It goes beyond the loss of cultural heritage. So, to give you a flavor of what happens is, all of us have our own accents while speaking English, Hindi, or any language, and it plays a crucial role in our identity. It's to an extent where I can just hear the accent of a person, and I'll be like, oh, you're from Jamaica, or you're from Kerala, right? Now imagine you buy Alexa and it doesn't uh, include your accent, it doesn't support your accent and you try to ask it like, Alexa, what's the, what's the weather? And it says, I hear birds squeaking. Like it, it doesn't feel nice, it doesn't feel good and it takes like about six months to an year for us to change our accent. And this is because we have 
two sensory organs working at the same time, our ears, our eyes, it helps us study faster, but for the hearing impaired or the deaf, it's quite hard. They take several years just to learn their local sign language, and then maybe ask them to change and learn the standard sign language. They only have one sensory organ working, that's their eyes. It takes a couple of years, so it's not worth it for them. In fact, the imposition of standardization usually forces them, they feel like they're being forced to change their identity, and they feel like it's a threat to their sign language. Here I have some responses that I got in my field work, and these are like what the deaf actually stated. Now this is faced by about 63 million people in India. In the world, it's about half a billion. Half a billion people face this. And when we impose this standardized sign language, the older generations, we cannot impose it on them that well because they take a long time to learn the standardized sign language. We target, due to that, we target the younger generations. So when they go home, like if you have a family of deaf people, when you go home and you are the child or the son tries to communicate with the granddad, they won't be able to communicate. There's like a gap because the sign language that they use is different. And this is awful. Hence, there is a need to change our approach while designing from a user-centered approach to something that focuses more on culture. And how do we do this? How do we create a device that is more focused on culture so that we don't create these kind of exclusionary effects? Well, uh, some of us have suggested that we should use the deaf in our process, like while designing the technology or the product, we should keep them and we should uh, take them in the role, give them roles in the designing process and take them through it from the start to the end. They will play a part in it. And this gives us an opportunity to understand their culture. They will act as cultural informants uh, other than, unlike uh, just feedback givers, unlike just customers giving feedbacks, they'll act as cultural informants, giving us a way into their culture. And this helps us understand their culture and create a product that is more inclusive of this culture. So the McDonald's example that I had given you actually turned out to fail in India. They were not getting enough sales, so they changed their approach. Indians were unwilling to change their culture, so they had to use a culture-centered approach and design a new burger that helped Indians, like it helped them sell it to Indians, and Indians loved it, and now it's their top seller. It's the McAlu Tiki. Now, I have used a similar approach, but I had to change it a bit while creating technologies for the deaf, because in my condition, we're not only focusing on the deaf community, we're focusing on their interactions with the hearing-enabled community as well. So when we do that, first we have to assemble a team, and the team consists of the deaf, it consists of people from tech like me, and it also consists of a teacher that has been teaching sign language for about a decade, and she is hearing enabled. So we could easily connect with the hearing enabled community and the deaf community. So first we lived a, a life, like a, a, a day in their life. We looked at their scenario from their shoes and we were able to uh, define the actual problem. Now during these steps, we include the deaf through all these steps. It is crucial for that. And when we define the problem, what we figured out was the problem for the deaf was actually not being unable to interact or uh, communicate with the hearing enabled, the problem that they were facing was with the linguistic structure. The linguistic structure was developed so oddly that it was hard to pick up, and it did not connect them with the vocal culture or the hearing enabled. So we, in the ideating stage, we uh, created, a, we thought of a linguistic structure that we could use for all the cultures easily, so it's not culture specific. And to this, we used the deaf's help for this, and then we made the prototype and tested it. Now, what's important is while testing it, we have to play the role of empathizing again. We have to empathize with them, look at it from their shoe, and we'll also test it on us acting as deaf people, so we get an idea as to how to redefine the problem if required. Now, this loop, we continuously do it until we get the dream product. 
and during this we also change the linguistic logic so that we can easily put it into technology without this like we made it simple enough that we won't need to use gpus which is quite expensive so all of these kind of small small changes we did with different people from different sectors so then we can culturally make a culturally cultural inclusive model or a design and now this is what we call a human centered design now we have been doing this and now we are testing it on gloves smart gloves as an example we are currently we are making the prototype and testing it so i'll end this talk with a plea when when creating or designing any product we should include the customer's culture it is very important very crucial otherwise often it may cause irreversible harm to them and to their culture as well so i plead with you try to be more culture sensitive while making products i would like to live in a world where i can express my rich culture and my unique identity and be happy a world like that and i believe all of you would also like a world like that a world not monotone simplified or plain a world that is not colored in a gray white scale a world that is filled with different colors and beauty a world with life thank you